A lot of people question what, what position or what's to happen with Islam and the things that we see today. And I would just like to assure you that God has given us answers, answers in His Bible. And I believe that uh, you'll see things that uh, possibly you've read in the past, never thought about things that may be new. But we're going to share things from the Old Testament and New Testament. And when we look at uh, the Muslim people or Islam, it consists of basically 23 to 25 percent of this world's population. That's one out of four people are Muslim almost. So it has a has a great uh, effect upon our world today. But we're going to look at uh, the book of Genesis. We're going to start in the book of Genesis chapter 15. We're going to look at who was, when we think of the Muslim people, who was the father of the Muslim people, so to speak? And that was Ishmael, and Ishmael's father was Abraham. So we're going to start looking at the story of Abraham. We know that God had called Abraham from the land of Ur, and we want to look at the land that he had promised to Abraham. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 15, please, if you'll turn in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 18. And it says, In the same day that the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So as we look at a map here, the land of promise was the land of Egypt right here, which flows down from northern Egypt to the south, or the Nile River. And also the Euphrates River, which is right here, which kitty corners up that way. So Abram was to inherit this whole piece of land right here. What we would know today is primarily the Middle East. But we've run into a problem. When we think of Abraham and Sarah, they were promised a child. And Abram and Sarah could not wait upon that promise, so what did they do? They took a handmaiden, a handmaiden by the name of Hagar. And they Sarah had asked Abram to go into the handmaid and to bring forth a son, and his name we know today is Ishmael. But we're going to look at Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, I'd like to read, have you to read when you get home sometime, a little more clarity on that. But we're going to read verses 11 and 12, because as we look at the story of Abram and Sari, we know that Ishmael came first, later the, pro the promised son came forth, and we had problems in the home with fighting. For God intended only to have one wife and the child Isaac to come through that seed. So let's look at Genesis chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, because it gives us an answer as to the problems that we're having today, thousands of years later, from the time when these two boys were born. Verse 11 says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael. And it says, Because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. The name Ishmael means God hears. It's a very specific name given to that boy, given by God, that God shall hear. And the reason why God gave him that name, because when, when the fighting came in the home, God had told Abram to listen to his wife and to cast the bondwoman and her seed out. But as Hagar and Ishmael were cast to the desert, Hagar had thought that God had left her to die. And as they were in that desert, the last of their water was drank, that God sent his angel, his messenger, to Hagar. And this messenger came to her and says, that my father has heard your affliction and he hears your voice. As we look at this story, God could have let Hagar and Ishmael die right then and there, but he did not. Later in the text it says, I will multiply his seed and make thee a great nation. But verse 12 is what we want to concentrate on. 11 and 12 is first. His name was Ishmael, God hears. And as we look at the end of the life of Ishmael, 
he had a conversion and he went back to the true worship of his God. He no longer worshipped like he did from the Egyptians. But verse 12 gives us a description of also the character of the Muslim people today and what's happening. It says, And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. So i like to suggest to you today that as we look at Muslim people, we see people that God hears, they're wanting to do God's will, and we also see Muslims that says here that they will be a wild man, and every man's hand against them will have war between his brethren and himself. So we see two sides to Islam today, as we did back then within, within uh, Ishmael's character. We're going to look at some stories here that talk about, from the book of the Old Testament scriptures, about the Muslim people. Because these are the things that we've been sharing with the Muslim people to get them interested in the Bible. Muslims believe this Bible is all false. And I'm going to suggest the reason why they believe it's false, because of how we live and how we act as Christians. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 25, because Genesis chapter 25 is going to give us the, the, the very foundation of what the, of what the Muslims are called in the Bible. Genesis chapter 25, if you will, please. Genesis chapter 25, verse 1 says, Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. Now this is Abraham's third wife, his third wife. First wife was Sari, second wife was Hagar, third wife was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, Jakshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. And Jakshan begat Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Lashum, Lemuam. And the sons of Midian, Ephah, Epher, and Hanak, and Abada, and Elda, all of these were the children of Keturah. And here's what we want to focus on, the next two verses. It says, And the sons of Excuse me, and Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Isaac was supposed to be his promised seed and, and later came to fulfillment and was. But look at what it says here. But unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived where? Eastward to the east country. So when we look at the promise that was given to Abraham, he was to be given this land here from the land of, or the Nile River to the Euphrates. But God had a problem to deal with. He now had a problem to deal with with Sari and Hagar and Ishmael. The Isaac was to be given the land of Canaan. I have marked out in blue. Do you remember the land of Canaan? Here it says in Genesis chapter 25, but unto the sons of the concubines, which would have been Keturah and Hagar's children, it says that, that, they were, that they were sent away and they were sent eastward. So if we've got Isaac's seed here and the others, the Ishmaelites, were sent eastward, we have the Arabian Desert or Northern Arabia. We want to take a look at also Genesis chapter 25, verse 18. It says of the lineage of Ishmael here what they were to inherit. It says, and they dwelt from where? Havilah. We've got Havilah here. Unto Shur. So Ishmael's lineage was to, was to, to inhabit this landmass right here. And that's what we see today as known in the Middle East. And many of these folks here are Muslim. We do have some Christians mixed in. Some Jewish too, but primarily the people of this land is the Muslim people. So when we look at Bible prophecy and who the Muslims are, they're called the children of the East. The children of the East. Let's take a look at Genesis 21, verse 17, please. 21, verse 17. And this correlates with what we just shared here. Because God did not forsake Ishmael. God is working with these people. 21, excuse me, 20, let's 
I need to check out here. I've lost my position. I, I believe it's Deuteronomy 21. Let's try Deuteronomy 21 or 18. Yes, yeah, so Deuteronomy 21, please. Deuteronomy 21, verses 15 through 17. It says, If a man have two wives, I'm going to suggest this is referring to Abraham, he's got two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the first son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn. The son of the hated for the... Who is the firstborn? Ishmael. And he was hated. By giving him a double portion of all that he hath. So Isaac here gets the land of Canaan. Ishmael gets all the rest of the land, a double portion. And when we look at the land today, it's full of oil. We always think of Saudi Arabia as just barren and desert. But even in the times of old, we're going to look at the stories of Solomon. Beneath these sands of nothing, there was much gold and rubies in this desert. God had given him a double portion of things to come. We're going to take a look at some stories now. And we're going to go to the book of Genesis chapter 37. We're going to look at the story of Joseph. Genesis chapter 37, please. We're going to look at the Ishmaelites. Genesis 37, verse 24. The Bible says, And they took him and cast him into a pit. This is referring to Joseph's brethren. And the pit was empty, for there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, the company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead, with their camels bearing spicery, balm, and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. And there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Here we've got Joseph's own brethren are casting them in the pit to die, to be forever lost. And God uses the Ishmaelites and the Midianites to come up and to protect Joseph and to deliver him. And by him bringing him back to Egypt, as Joseph worked, as the God of heaven worked on his heart and through the land of Egypt, Joseph was then used later to help save the rest of his brethren. So if it wasn't for the Ishmaelites, Joseph would have never made it to Egypt safely and he would have died. God used the Ishmaelites. They may not have known that specifically, but God used them in a roundabout way. Let's take a look at Job chapter 1, please. Job chapter 1. Remember that I said the Ishmaelites and the Midianites were called what? The children of the East. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1 verse 1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance was also seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest man of all the East. Job was a child of the East. He was on the other side, the opposite side from Isaac's side. He was a forefather of the Muslim people. Let's take a look now at uh, the story of Moses. Everyone knows the story of Moses. Moses was the land of Egypt. He slaughtered a guy. He fled. 
And we're going to see where he fled to. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 2, please. Exodus 2. Verse 15, it says, Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. I'm going to show you the land of Midian. Right down here is the land of Midian, right in this area right here, somewhere around where that star is at. So Moses is up here in Egypt. He slays the man. He flees here to the land of Midian. Okay. He flees to the land of Midian. And in chapter 3, it gives us an idea of Midian. Of a man that's there that God uses. Now Moses 3 verse 1 says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, now take a look at who Jethro is in the next part after the, the sentence there. It says, the priest of Midian. The Midianites, the children of the east. He was a priest of Midian. He was a teacher. He was a teacher of the one true God in the foundation, the foundational beliefs that we have in his word. It also tells us here, in Exodus chapter 18, I believe. Exodus 18. It gives us a little more understanding of Jethro. 18 verse 1. Remember, this is a child of the east, the other side of the family. It says, When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, Let's look down to verse 9. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord hath done unto Israel. So here we've got a child of the east. He rejoices when God delivers the Israelites. And he's a man of God. And verse 12 gives us an idea that he had an understanding of salvation. I want to point this out. Today when we look at the Muslim people, they don't understand salvation, do they? But I'm going to suggest to you that in past history, their forefathers understood the things that you and I do today. Let's take a look at verse 12. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. We know that in the Old Testament scripture that those that took the burnt offering and sacrifices, it was symbolic of the future life that Christ would live and the sacrifice that he would give. So the Muslim people of old, their forefathers, understood salvation. But today, they've lost sight of that. And I would suggest that today, that it's up to you and I to bring back that same understanding to them. Let's take a look at uh, the story of Solomon, the Queen of Sheba. I've got the map here again. I want to show you where the Queen of Sheba, the land of Sheba, is right here in the lower Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Okay. Let's take a look at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, please. Chapter 9, and I'm just going to read a few verses from this chapter here. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem. Verse? 9 verse 1, 9-1, I'm sorry. And, she be and they bear spices of gold in abundance and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. Now I want to look down to verse 13, chapter 9, verse 13. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred and three score and six talents of gold, besides that which Chapman and the merchants brought. And all the kings of Arabia and governors of the country brought gold and silver to who? To Solomon. So here we've got the children of the east, the Arabian kings, 
They bring the gold to Solomon, and not only did they bring gold, they brought ivory and many other things, trees, amalgam trees, and they were actually used in the building. They were actually used to build the temple that Solomon built. So the other side of the family had a part in the building of God's temple at that time. So if they did business, obviously these children of the East, their hearts were right with God. Could you not say that? If they brought gifts to Solomon, could you not say that their hearts were right? Let's take a look at another story here in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Again, we're focusing on the children of the East. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and what? Have come to worship him. So the, the wise men of the east, the children of the east, the Muslims' forefathers came to bring gifts to Jesus and to worship him. Today we don't see Muslims worshiping Christ, so to speak. But if we look at the past, their forefathers did. Now let's take a look at the gifts that they brought. Verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. I brought some, uh, some of the frankincense and myrrh here. I'll let you guys pass these around to smell them. But the children of the East, the wise men of the East, brought these gifts to the birth of Christ. And when we look at these gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, remember when Joseph and Mary were warned in a dream to flee to the land of Egypt because Herod wanted to destroy all of the children, the boys? That gold that they brought was used by Joseph and Mary to survive in the land of Egypt, to buy and sell food and the things that they needed. The frankincense. The frankincense, when we look at the Old Testament sanctuary service, was used for a thank or praise offering. And we look at the myrrh, and we look at the life of Christ when he was about ready to, before his crucifixion, Remember the aloes, the myrrhs that were poured upon him before his death to help him? So here the children of the East bring gifts that would, that would be used throughout Christ's life and exemplify a people from the other side that were given gifts to Christ. Let's going to look at Isaiah chapter 60, please. Isaiah chapter 60. This is a chapter that you and I could be a fulfillment of. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 says, Arise and shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light as kings to thy brightness. We want to take a look at who these Gentiles are. Let's take a look at verses 6 and 7, please. Isaiah 60, 6 and 7. It says, The multitudes of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian, Ephah, all they from Sheba. Remember, Sheba was the lower Arabian desert. All they from Sheba. They shall come and bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. All of the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee, and the rams of Nebaioth. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 25. We're going to look at the word Kedar and Nebaioth. Genesis 25. Genesis 25. Genesis 25, we're going to look at verse 13. Now these are the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaioth, and Kedar. 
If we go back to Isaiah chapter 60 there, verse 7, it talks about Kedar and Obeath. And the last half of the verse it says, They shall come up with acceptance upon my altar. You see, Isaiah chapter 60 is a prophecy talking about the very end of time that the children of the east, Ishmael's lineage, are going to hear the message of salvation and many of them are going to accept it. And it says here that they're going to come up with acceptance upon my altar. And today we say Muslims don't accept Christ. But let's take a look at verse 9, what it says there. Verse 9 talks about these people. Surely the isle shall wait for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, for their silver and their gold with them, unto what? The Lord thy God. The Lord thy God is referring to the one true God of heaven. And the next key word we have there, and. What's the word and mean? There's someone else. And. The Lord thy God, the one true God of heaven, and. The Holy One of Israel. Who was the Holy One of Israel? Jesus. So here it's talking about the Muslim people. They're coming with true worship to the one true God and they're accepting His Son. And when we look at the world today, what does most Christianity say about the Muslim people? They write them off. They write them off. But I would suggest that you and I have the opportunity to share with these people. That we can be a part, a part of this fulfillment. When we look at every prophecy in the Bible, what's concerning us or our time or the period of the time of who it was for, there's people on both sides of that prophecy. People that were following what was right to fulfill that prophecy on the side of God. And the people that were following that prophecy on the opposite side of God. When we look at Daniel chapter 7, we looked at the, the great war, the great uh, uh, false, the false church that was raised up. There was people on both sides at that time period. I want to take a look at Genesis chapter 28 verse 9, please. Genesis 28 verse 9. Remember we're sharing that the children of the East are the Muslim people in the Bible. And we're looking at stories that talk about them in a different light than what you and I hear in the news today. 28 verse 9 says. Actually, let's take a look at uh, verse 8. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. So Esau knew that he was not to take daughters from the land of Canaan. His first wives he did, but now he sees it pleased not his father. And look at what it says here. Then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth, to be his wife. So here we have Ishmael's daughter, and she's a true worshiper of the one true God. Now let's take a look at the story of Jonah. What side of the family was Jonah on? Isaac's side, the Israelites. And he was to go to where? Nineveh. The Ninevites were the children of the east. And Jonah did not want to go to those people. Are we Jonahs today not wanting to go to the other side of the family? And what did the Ninevites do when Jonah preached to them? They all repented of their sin. Every one of them and God spared them. Now later in the story it shows that they went back into their sin. But for a time, they had, they had changed and went back to what God had wanted. I've shared some stories about uh, the Muslims in a positive light. Now we want to share some stories and different things about Revelation chapter 9. We're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 has many things to say about the Muslim people. I'm going to give you a quick rundown here of the charts behind me, what we got. These charts here, this one here is called the 1843 chart. It was printed in 1843. 
And this one's the 1850 chart. What we've got here is the story of Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, the rise and falls of the kingdoms. We had Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and we had the uh, ten toes. And the ten toes were ten nations. And as uh, Mark had presented earlier, the stone that was cut out without hands represented who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. So this stone here represents the second coming. And we're looking at the time period now that we're in the ten toes time period between then and the second coming. And these are the things that we're going to share. The things that we're going to share today with you involve Revelation chapter 9, describing what happens in the time of these ten toes. Okay? God gave us prophecies to know where we're at in time. For instance, there's prophecies of Jesus Christ, of His crucifixion and resurrection. Prophecies give you landmarks where you're at in time. It's just like you going down this road here. Some of you came from, I'm not sure my direction here, but you came from the right or the left. As you came closer, there were specific businesses that you knew to show that you were getting closer to this point. God has given us prophecies to know where we're at. And prophecies, people today think nothing of prophecies, but what prophecies do today is they help people come to believe in the Word of God. There's people that do not believe this word, and when you share specific time prophecies and you've got historical events to prove that, they will now pick up those Bibles and become believers. And we're going to share some of that in Revelation chapter 9. There's two prophecies in Revelation chapter 9 that were presented in the 1800s, and when they were presented, thousands of people that never believed in God or the Bible opened up their Bibles, became believers and followers of Jesus Christ for the first time in their life. So let's take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, please. Revelation chapter 9. And remember, the time period that we're talking is right here in the Ten Divisions of, of Western Rome. From that period on to the second coming. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened up the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts. We're going we're gonna to look at the word locusts, okay? Just like in Bible prophecy, Babylon represented the, the lion with wings, Medo-Persia, the bear, Greece, the leopard, the four-headed leopard, Rome. We're going to be looking at locusts. The locusts of Bible prophecy represents the Muslim people. For instance, the origins of the locust is Saudi Arabia. The, the insect itself. So when we look at Bible prophecy, the logo or symbol for the Muslim people is the locust. Okay? Did everyone hear that? Locust? That's a key point. Locust. And it says, Unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but what? These locusts were to hurt only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. We're going to take a look at Judges chapter 6 because I'm, I'm going to give you a text that, that ties in the locusts with the Muslim people. Let's turn to Judges chapter 6, please. Judges chapter 6. It's after Deuteronomy, after Joshua. Judges chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through, 1 through 5. It says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Israel is doing evil. God's own people, His chosen people, 
or doing evil. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up, the Amalekites, and who? The children of the east. Remember the children of the east are the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. So when Israel sinned, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the Ishmaelites came up to war against Israel. Verse 4, And they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come unto Gaza, and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle, and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers, or locusts for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. So here in chapter 6 verse 5 we've got grasshoppers or locusts. The children of the east are grasshoppers or locusts. They come in great number and they come into the land to destroy it. Do we see the same problems going on today? This was in reference to Israel of old. But we have the same problem happening today. The children of the east, the Muslims, the locusts are doing the same thing to the Palestinians and the Israelites and the different things in the land of the Canaan area again today. Could it be that the same reason why back then they were allowed to come in because God's people again today are in apostasy? That they're not following truth? Has not Israel, the majority of Israel itself, rejected the Messiah? Could it be that God's using wars to come to these people, to break them, to get them out of their life of convenience and, and just running and doing their own things to think that possibly that there's an end coming to them as a people. Could it be that the same thing could be happening to you and us today in the United States? That God's using wars to wake this country up because of its prosperity. So Judges chapter 6, we have the children of the east, or the Muslim people, linked as locusts. Locusts. So let's take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 21, please. 2 Chronicles 21. I'm going to give you a little insight here as to this chapter. You could go back and read it. But 2 Chronicles 21 is we've got the story of, uh, of Elijah. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 19. God's people are in sin again in chapter, in chapter 21, verse 10. It says, So the Edomites revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. The same time also did Libna revolt from under his hand, because he had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. You see, people back in that time had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. They, they started worshiping and following false gods. And Elijah's at this time, and he's calling people back to the true worship of God. And we're going to look at verse 16 here, 21 verse 16, because I want to I show you here uh, what is happening to God's people again. It says, moreover, who? The Lord. The Lord is doing this. The Lord stirred up against Jehoram, the spirit of the Philistines, and of who? The Arabians, that were near the Ethiopians. And they came up to Judah and break into it. Because of God's own people, we're going into apostasy. God stirred up the spirit of the Arabians to come and war against his people. Today, everything you see on the news, you see the war between Israel, Islam, and Christianity. Is God stirring these people up again? Let's take a look at, uh, we read chapter 9, verse 3. We looked at the word locust. These locusts were to hurt the people that had not the seal of God in their foreheads. 
I want to look at the last verses of Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 through 21. And we're going to go through the rest of this, this chapter too, but I want, I want to focus on the first and the last half because the locusts are coming to punish those that have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And the last verses tell us about these people and what they believe and who they are. Verse 20 says, The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues of locusts, Yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not what? They should not worship devils. Okay? These people are involved in devil worship. It goes on and says, And idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. I want to share a, a picture of a church we've got here. This is a, a picture of a church that Jace and I went into in New York City. This is an Episcopal church. And I want to share some things that we have within this church. You see the statues here. It's a whole line of statues that people worship. If you get in the stained glass, you can't see it here, but farther above there's pictures. All throughout this temple there was pictures and images of Mary. Now if there's anyone here or anyone that's listening, the things that we're sharing many people do not know. Because we have pastors and teachers that are teaching us things that are not found in the Word of God. But God is getting us back into the Bible to understand Him and His ways. And there's people that understand what they're teaching is false and they're still teaching these things. But God is wanting you to see what He wants you, how He wants you to live from His Word. So when we look at this, this church here, we, we were presented with the Antichrist power, the, the, the Roman papacy and the teachings that it, was, that it had taught. The falsehoods that it was bringing in, the confusion that it was bringing in. We're going to find here in Revelation chapter 9 that Revelation chapter 9 is talking about the Roman papacy that is commanding devil worship that it's worshiping idols of gold and silver and stone. And in verse 21 it says, Neither repented they of their what? Of their murders. You see, this church was persecuting and killing Christians that were involved in true worship. And we have forgotten these things through the ages because many of us have grown up in this country. We're third, fourth generation, some that have been over here and the stories are no longer being passed down as to how we came to this country. Let's take a look at uh, Daniel chapter 11 with me if you would. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 33 through 36. Verse 33 says, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. This is referring to the time of the Reformation. When Martin Luther is coming out of the Roman church and the 95 Thesis is nailed to the wall, God's people are now opening the Bibles again that have been lost for years that the church was trying to burn and hide. It's now coming back and God is bringing a revival amongst His people. Yet they shall fall by the sword. This is the Roman church killing the true Christians. Okay? By flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. 
And some of them of understanding shall fall to try and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end. We're referring here to the time, the 1260 time period, the three and a half years of the 42 months. Because it is yet for a time appointed. And here's what I want to focus on in verse 36. And the king, the king here is the pope, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till his indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Verse 37. Neither shall he regard who? The God of his fathers. So when we look at the early Christian church, it worshipped the one true God and now the Pope. The Pope is coming in and he's honoring someone else. He's worshipping someone else. Neither the desire of women. You see, the Popes cannot marry. They cannot marry. And then it goes on to say, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And verse 38 gives us a description of who he worships and honors. But in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not, He will honor with what? Gold and silver with precious stones and pleasant things. You see, if our heart is not right, all the money we give means nothing. This faith of religion is involved in false worship. And God is wanting to share things, just like the things that you have learned. He's wanting to share these things with these people because He loves the Roman Catholic people. Many of you have families and friends that are involved in these churches that have no idea. And the main reason why that no one has any idea is because they don't read the Bible. They take whatever the speaker says is truth and runs with it. And may I suggest to you and I that if we're going to stand in the times that is coming to us, the only way that you're going to stand is if you're reading this every day and submitting your life. Every day. Now I'm going to take a look back at that picture we had here and uh, mention a few things about it. I'm just going to cover this up here. What does that look like from your distance? Does it look like two eyes and a nose and a skull? Yeah. Can you see that? When we took this picture, we never seen that. We never had seen that. What a scary looking emblem. If you look real close here, there's two swords sticking up through it. Two swords. This is the God of force, the God that the Pope worships. This is the signature of his God. And we're going to share a little bit more. And I'm going to flip a slide here. Here we've got the Pope. He's got the triketra in his, in his head, in his miter. Can you see the triketra up here? The triketra. That triketra was in the last thing here. There's the triketra. Look at how it forms the number six on each one. Remember we presented previous that the Pope was called... Vicarious Philae Dei. This same triketra is found in this picture here that we found in this church. And it was represented as the triune God or the God of force. So the Pope is worshiping a God that is not biblical. I'd like to read something here that, that the Roman church states. It says that those who hold the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to be one Godhead and equal majesty are Catholic Christians. Others are heretics who will be struck with divine vengeance and well as by the imperial action undertaken according to heaven's arbitration. 
So here we've got the Roman church stating that anyone that believes a different God than what it is stating is a heretic. And we had shared that there the other night, the ten nations. We had the, the little horn that was coming up. We had the Pope here that was coming up amongst the ten horns, was uprooting those three. And those three horns were uprooted because they did not believe in the Trinity or the triune God. You see, when we look at historical evidence, it gives us an idea of people and who they worship and how that's portrayed and how they handle other people. I want to read something here. Is there any Presbyterians here tonight? This comes from a Presbyterian by the name of Albert Barnes in reference to Revelation chapter 9. The things that we're teaching here tonight, every Protestant group once taught. The Lutherans taught it. The Baptists taught it. The Presbyterians taught it. The seven trumpets, the fifth. The first caliph of the Saracens, he, Muhammad, was like a star that fell from heaven. Revelation 9, verse 1. It comes here from Albert Barnes, the Presbyterian. We'll go to the next slide. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. I'm going to read that. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star or messenger fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given a key of the bottomless pit. Now we're going to look at the word heaven. Many times when the, when the Bible was translated, there's a few points within the Bible where it didn't come out correctly between the Hebrew and the Greek and so forth. But we want to look at what the word heaven means here because it gives us a better understanding of Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. Remember, the Presbyterian says that Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 referred to Muhammad. Okay, let's read here. It says, perhaps, perhaps from the same as G3735, through the idea of elevation, the sky, by extension, heaven, as the boat of God, by implication, happiness, power, eternity, Specifically the gospel or Christianity. Could, so it could have been any one of those. I've got highlighted in yellow what I believe it, it appears to be. The gospel or Christianity. This star or messenger was Muhammad. Who's called the messenger of Islam? Muhammad. He fell from heaven, and heaven means gospel or Christianity. At one time, Muhammad was a follower of the one true God and presented truth. But he fell. He turned from truth. Do we see that today within men and women? They turn. So now you've got a group of people, Muslims, following someone that's fallen. Someone that's turned from the gospel. Just like today, we've got false preachers, false prophets, false speakers. And what do they do? They lead people away from the truth. Today, we've got a whole religion based upon now following a man that has fallen, that never lived the perfect life, like you and I know, we, follow, we should be following the man Christ, Jesus. They're not reading the scriptures of Jesus every day. Do you think that they're going to have victory and a change in their life when they're following a man that's dead and lived in sin? So here we've got the Muslim people following a man in tradition upon someone who was once following truth, but fell. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 9 again. I want to show you. I've got... Uh, can you folks see this in the back? I've got a chart up here. i got Isa or Isa. This is what the Muslims call Jesus. Isa or Messiah. We've got a timeline here. In 321, does anyone remember what happened in 321? Constantine changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. Sunday. 325, we've got the Council of Nicaea. The churches are coming to change the biblical understanding of who God is. And then year 538, we've got here where the the Pope comes up amongst the ten horns or the ten toes, uproots the three, begins his, his, his reign or his rule, and he rules for 1,260 years. 
and it ends in 1798. Now here's what I want you to focus on. We focus on Revelation chapter 9. We're focusing on the fifth war, or the fifth trumpet, which is right here. We're not discussing the first four wars. But you can see a correlation here. You see when Jesus had his death, burial, and resurrection, what happened amongst this time? The church went from a pure church to bringing in pagan worship. These wars started just shortly after they're bringing in false worship. God's bringing in wars. He's bringing in wars to awaken His people. And we're looking at the fifth trumpet, the fifth war, which is during this time period right here. The Pope comes up here right in 538. 570 is when Muhammad's born. Look how close the time period that is. Very close, isn't it? As the Roman church is up here and it's slaughtering God's true people, people that keep the Sabbath, people that believe in the one true God, people that are reading their Bibles and wanting to go to heaven, this church up here starts the persecution, the Dark Ages. At that time, God raises up Muhammad and the Muslims. In Revelation chapter 9, it talks about these locusts, or the Muslims. They were to come to war against those that were involved in false worship. I'm going to show you another map here so you get an idea. That's a timeline of where we're at, but I'm going to show you a map of what was actually happening. Here, up in this area here, we've got the time of Martin Luther. He's coming out of the Roman church. You've got all the other reformers, Huss, Jerome, all these people that were burned at the stake. At that time, God raises up the Muslims. The, the green map here, the map that shows the green area was the rise of Islam. The Muslims are coming up to war against the Roman Catholics. At this time period here, as the Pope is wanting to kill the true Christians, the Muslims are coming, and it's a deterrent. It's kind of like if you were in a boxing match. You deter with a jab, 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 and then boom. God had used the Muslims to come in a specific time to deliver His people. Now, when we think of Europe, how did America become? <coughs> These true Christians that wanted to worship without a king or a pope, God opened the door for them to move to the West, to this new country called the United States, so they could worship truly. The, the country that you and I live in now, there's a reason why you're here. Because your forefathers made a decision that I want to move from a land that is destroying false Christianity. We want to move to a land where we can live in freedom and worship God freely. And God has given this country the abundance of finance, and what are we doing with it? Are we giving it to the rest of this world to proclaim the gospel? Or are we building larger homes, fancier cars, and doing what we want with it? There's a reason why you're in this country. It's not by chance. We're at the very end of time, and God has given you people the understanding. Here's a quote from Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was the second man in command after Muhammad. He says, When you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men, without turning your backs, but let not your victory be stained with the blood of women and children. See, they were not to kill the women and children. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle. Only such as you kill to eat. When you make any covenant or article, stand to it, and be as good as your word. And as you go, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries and propose to themselves to serve God that way. Look at what it says here. Let them alone and neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. So there's a group of Christians there to leave alone. Do not touch them. And then it says, and you will find another sort of people that belong to what? The synagogue of Satan. Who have who have shaven crowns. This is referring to the monks of the Roman church. Be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn Mohammedans or pay tribute. They were given a command to kill those of the Roman persuasion and those who were following that and the true Christians they were to leave alone. The Muslims were to leave the true Christians alone. 
This comes from uh, the Quran. This is the commands coming from the Quran now. Surah 929 says, Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they are the people of the book, until they pay jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So the Muslims were to fight those that were living a life of what God had forbidden. They were to fight those that were bound to idols. They were to fight the Christians that were drinking. Christians that were living lives that the Bible does not support. Smoking, eating pork, idolatry. Surah 3, 113 says, Not all of them are alike. Of the people of the book, they're a portion that stand for the right. They rehearse the signs of Allah all night long and then prostrate themselves in adoration. They believe in Allah in the last day, they enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong, and they hasten in emulation in all good works. And then it says, they are in the ranks of the righteous. The Quran talks about a group of Christians that are considered righteous. The question for us today is, are we found with the righteousness of Christ, or are we living the same life of the Christians back then that the Muslims were to come to hurt and destroy? This here's a quote comes from a Baptist preacher, William Miller. And it says, Revelation 9, verse 3. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. By these locusts I understand armies. See Joel's first and second chapters. Therefore I should read this, the text, thus. And there came out of these Mohammedan followers large armies, which should have great power to what? Execute the judgments of God. On this the anti-Christian beast, which had filled the earth with her abominations. So the Muslims or the locusts were coming to destroy those of the Roman persuasion and its apostate beliefs. Verse 4, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which had not the seal of God in their foreheads. So the Muslims were to leave the true Christians alone, and they were to hurt those men which had not the seal of God in their foreheads. Remember what Mark shared the other night? What was the seal of God? Those that keep the first commandment. Those that keep the second commandment. The third commandment. And the fourth commandment is an outward sign of who we worship. Because you can see who is doing true worship by which day they worship on. By grass, green things, and trees. Psalm 72, 16. Hosea 14, 8. I understand the true church or people of God. By those, excuse me, by those men having not the seal of God, etc. I understand the anti-Christian church or the papal Rome. Then thus would be the sense, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the true church or people of God, but only the anti-Christian beasts or powers subject to her. Now I've got the question. We look at Rome back then and we talked about the Dark Ages. What powers today are subject to the Roman Catholic Church today? Do you think the United States could be subject to her? When this country first became, there was not one Roman Catholic Church here. None. They were all Protestant churches protesting Rome. Today when you look, what, what things are being taught from this country as a whole? We're teaching the same doctrines that the Roman Church taught as a whole. And God is now raising up Islam again. Is it any coincidence that Islam's rising up? This is in reference to Revelation chapter 9, verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were like crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. During this time period here, the Roman church, you've got the Muslims here, it shows the crowns. 
the things I'm going to share with you from here on out, you can look up in, on the internet. You want to look up Top Copy Palace. Top Copy Palace is found in Istanbul, Turkey, and this is where the Roman capital it was at one time. It's now a museum where you can find all of these articles. You see, these things that we're sharing with you here in Revelation chapter 9 is what we're sharing with Muslims. The, Bible, the Muslims say the Bible is false. We have articles of history within their museums promoting that Revelation chapter 9 is true and revolves around them. We're going to take a look at Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 now. We looked at the fifth trumpet, or the fifth woe, excuse me, fifth war. Now we're going to look at the sixth trumpet. We're going to look at another time period that still involves the Muslims, but it's given something else to do. 9 verse 13 says, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is where? Before God. This command is coming from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, so the command is coming from where? It's coming from heaven. God's doing the command. And Revelation chapter 1 says that the understanding that we have comes from God the Father through Jesus Christ to the angel to the messenger John. There's an order. This message is coming from the Father to the Son, commanding these locusts. And look at what it says. Verse 14, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels or four messengers which were bound where? In the great Yiver Euphrates. These four messengers, they refer here, I've got them marked in red, Baghdad, Damascus, Aleppo, and Iconium. These four messengers or these four caliphs that were the heads of the Muslim people, they were to let loose. You see, we've got Rome up here, we've got up here by Vienna, we've got, we've got the Reformation, the time of the Reformation's taking place, Martin Luther and them are on the run, God raises up these four caliphs, these Muslim people to come war into this area. When we look at here, I should go back here, we're also talking about the time of the Ottoman Empire. Has anyone heard of the Ottoman Empire? The Ottoman Turks. The first battle that they presented was right here in the Battle of Nicomedia. The Turks are now pushing this way. And now we're going to look at some of the, we're going to look at some of the warfare and the different things that they had at this time that they used in this war. Remember in Revelation chapter 9 verse 1 it talks about these locusts. Okay? Look at the head of this locust. Does it not look like the head of this? These here were the mass that the Ottoman Turks had on their horses for protecting their horses when they went into battle. Right down here you can see, this is an old, this is an old one here, you can find a top copy palace. But here it shows an Ottoman Turk right on it. You see, God has given us evidence for past history. Some of the greatest things that have been hid in history have been hid from us, from the Bible. Because no one's presenting Bible prophecy anymore. Here's another thing here that shows the masks that the horses wore. The bow and arrows that the Ottoman Turks used. Here they got a picture of them on it. Not only do we believe it from the Bible, but they've got pictures to evaluate what our Bible's saying. When it talks about the locusts with the horses in vision. They've got that and they don't even know it. This here is the cannon. Look at the size of that cannon. That cannon, I, I believe if I read right, it was 12 palms wide, 12 hands wide. If you look at those people down there, you could pretty much fit three quarters of your body within that cannon. They were the first ones, the Ottoman Turks were the first ones to come up with gunpowder. Rome had the possibility of having it first. They denied it. Now the Muslims come in, the first one to have gunpowder. 
They would have cannonballs that would fit in these here that would weigh anywhere from 600 to 1,200 pounds. When these Muslims here came in to fight against the Romans, right here, Constantinople, they lined up at one mile's distance with all these cannons, and they shot. They shot all these things that brought down the walls of Constantinople. And when you look at that capital in Constantinople today, it's basically Muslim there. All the Muslims, there's Christians that go there too, but uh, Islam took over. They came to rule. Another thing we talk about too is when we, when we look at these cannons, you know how large they were. They didn't have roads like you and I do. When they were bringing these cannons and heading to Constantinople, they would have men. They would have shovels. They would have saws. They'd have all these things. They had to make somewhat of a path. Because you look at the weight of this. They brought this in on 30 wagons. They'd have 200 men on each side of this wagon. Because if you can imagine this was on a wagon, how tippy it would be. They had 200 men on the left, 200 men on the right with ropes tied to this cannon to help secure it when they're going. Because you can imagine like you go, imagine an old wood, an old wooden wagon, you're heading down a trail like the Pioneers. You know how it wobbles? Well, you've got this big heavy thing on that. What's it going to do? It's going to plop right over and fall. And once you've done that, then you've got to get it back in the air. You've got to suspend it again. So they did all they could to keep that in the air. Another thing they had is when you look at the Ottoman Turks and the Arabians, one thing that helped them win the war was the Arabian horse. These horses were raised in the tents with their children. They had open-faced tents, and these, these horses were raised from baby colts. And you can imagine the kids petting and playing them, playing with them, and the, and the horses becoming so familiar with their masters. Another thing that the, the, the Muslims had that helped win the war, I've got on the chart here, is uh, gunpowder. They were the first one to have gunpowder with muskets. And these muskets sometimes would shoot, would shoot lead balls, five to ten of them, they could shoot at one time. And when they would shoot, they'd be riding on these horses. We're going to take a look at a, at a we're going to take a look at a verse here. Let's look at Revelation 9, verse 17, please. Remember, this is John speaking. He says, And thus I saw what? The horses in vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lion, and what? Out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Here we've got the picture of the, the Ottoman Turks and the horses that John saw. And what the Ottomans are doing is they're ducking down on their horses and they're getting ready to shoot. So John had never, at his time when John was given this vision, he knew nothing of the warfare and the weaponry at that time. So when he seen this vision of fire come out of the horse, it was actually the muskets when they shot. It was the burning of the sulfur and whatnot coming out. So John had a vision of the, the Ottoman Turks or Muslims warring against the Antichrist power and trying to bring it to its knees. I'm going to share another quote here. This comes from the History of Protestantism by J.A. Wiley. J.A. Wiley. You're going to want to get this book or get it online if you can. It says, When a crisis arose in the affairs of the Reformation, and the kings obedient to the Roman see had united their swords to strike, and with the blow so decisive that they should not need to strike a second time, the Turk, or the Ottoman Turk, obeying one whom he knew not, would straightway present himself on the eastern limits of Europe, and in so a menacing an attitude, that the swords unsheathed against the poor Protestants had to be turned in another quarter. The Turk was the lightning rod that drew off the tempest. Thus did who? Christ cover his little flock with the shield of the Moslem. The true Christians are being persecuted and killed, and Christ says, I've had enough. I'm going to command the Muslims to come war against the apostate church. 
Christ used the Muslim to protect his own people. Revelation chapter 9, let's look at that verse again, because it's referring to this quote, this text. Revelation 9, verse 13, The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. This voice is Jesus commanding the Ottoman Turks to let these four angels or messengers go and to come war against false Christianity. I've got one more quote here. This comes, it's got Martin Luther's words himself in it. It is you, said the adherents of the old creed addressing the Lutherans. This is, this is the papacy talking to Martin Luther, okay? Who have brought this scourge upon us. It is you who have unloosed these angels of evil. They have come to chastise you for your heresy. You have cast off the yoke of the Pope, and now you must bear the yoke of the Turk. Now listen to what Martin Luther says. This is Martin Luther. Not the papacy, Martin Luther. Not so, said Luther. It is God who has unloosed this army, whose king is Abaddon, the destroyer. They have been sent to punish us for our sins, our ingratitude for the gospel, our blasphemies, and above all, our shedding of the blood of the righteous. Martin Luther said that God unloosed this war to punish the church of the day because it was commanding people to worship on a false day, to bow to idols, to worship a false god, and all the other things that go with it. God allowed this war to happen, and he used this war to protect Martin Luther himself. We're going to take a look at uh, Joel chapter 2. We're going to wrap up here. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 talks about the locusts again. And I want to go back to that text there that William Miller had here. He says that uh, Revelation 9, he also mentioned the locusts in Joel's chapter 1 and 2, referred to the Muslim people. And I want to suggest to you today that Joel chapter 2 is for our time. One thing to remember that, that the uh, the prophets they not only had visions for their time but they had visions for our time. The things of the Old Testament still apply to our time. There's things that you could find in there, and I'm suggesting that Joel's chapter 1 and 2, specifically Joel chapter 2, is in reference to the time that you and I are living in today, because we see Islam coming up again. Let's look at Joel chapter 2, please. I've got to find it there. I'm Joel chapter 2 says, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. We looked at the fifth and sixth trumpet, the fifth and sixth war on these charts. It says, blow ye the trumpet. Now we're looking at the seventh trumpet, the last great war. The last great war, which is the time that you and I live in. Let all the inhabitants of the land, what? Tremble. Why should we be trembling? For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess. You see, sin is abounding in our country. We have forgotten the God of our fathers, that, that God had led us in the times past. He's given us a land now to worship freely. We're looking at a time period now where people are turning from God. A, time of, a day of darkness and gloominess. Let's look at uh, verse 3. Does anyone have a title above verse 3? Locusts, the locusts compared to a well-disciplined army. It says, a fire devoureth before them. This is referring to the locusts. And behind them a flame burneth. The land is what? As a garden of Eden. Before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Ye and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is the appearance of horses. And horsemen, shall, so shall they run. I'm going to move down to verse 10 and 11. I don't want to, 
is following too much on this chapter, but we could look at it more in detail later. Verse 10 says, The earth shall quake before them. Could it be that the locusts of today, Islam, God's raising up again? And it says, The earth shall quake before them. When you look in the news today, what do you see? And you're seeing Christians being beheaded, right? What faith are they? What do they believe? Are they believing the same that we've seen in past history? Or are they involved in true worship? That's the question for you to ask, and I'm going to suggest they're not involved in true worship. But God wants to use with what's happening today to use you and I to share with these other Christians of other faiths that don't have the true understanding. It will protect their life. Verse 10, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall utter His voice before His army. For His camp is very great, for He is strong that what? Executeth His word. We had uh, William Miller here. Same words that he used. Joel chapter 1 and 2. The locusts, the Muslim armies, would execute the judgments of God on false Christianity. And I believe it's, we're in the process of moving into that again today. When we look at uh, the things that are happening today, Mark's going to share Revelation chapter 13 later on. But God has given in His Word specifically what this country does and has prophetically foretold what this country will do. Joel chapter 2 correlates it. I'm not going to expound too much on it. But the things that you're seeing in the news is no coincidence. God is wanting to wrap things up, but He's waiting for people. He's waiting for people that have never heard the message that you and I have. He's got Hindus out there that don't know Christ. He's got Muslims that don't. Catholics, Presbyterians, every faith there's people of that are not following the one true God and His only begotten Son. I look back at one time in my life I had no interest in God. I was drinking and drugging. My dad invited me to a seminar like this. It was the first time that I seen that the God of heaven cared for me as a person, that I was lost. And I believe that sharing these prophecies and the things that you have learned in the Bible will do the same things to the people on the streets that don't even want God in their lives at this point. But there's things in His Word that will awaken them. In the book of Ezekiel, it says, Prophesy to these dry bones. Prophecy helps people to believe that the Word of God is true. And that's not where it ends. That's only the starting point. Now the point comes to when they connect themselves with Christ and start following Him. And I think of heaven that where Lucifer was cast out. You look at heaven right now, there's total harmony. There's not one fight. There's not one argument. And God wants that same thing for your families. He wants your family to be loving and kind, to exemplify the family of heaven, to be a family here on earth, to give a taste to others around what they could have if they will choose it. And may God be with you.